husband, I'm the chair of the society, and uh, we're very, very pleased that we can have these events in spite of the present situation that we're, we're in. And it's marvellous to go down the list and see such, such, such a, 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 a huge quantity of old friends who normally wouldn't be able to be... Yeah, I'll leave it then. Just leave it. Um, leave it, darling. Yes, including, good evening, Patricia. It's wonderful that you can be with us. Oh, my um, God, can you hear me? <laughs> I hope not. Oh, yes, you have to put it on mute if you don't want to be Oh, heard. please, please put on mute. mute. It's too dreadful, too no, shaming. No, 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 and no, Craig, no, I, I really um, don't. No, no, put me on mute. And no sign of me. Um, you have to do the muting yourself. Um, it's, mute, darling. Okay. So I'm going to request everybody to put their system on mute so we can only hear Philip Mansell in perfect clarity. There we are. So I think that um, uh, we've had, um, uh, Philip is of course an extremely uh, well-known writer on things Ottoman and Turkish and we look forward very much to his, his presentation. And I will try and do the questions in informally as possible, although uh, we'll have to jump Leave that. Leave it. Ah. Leave it. Um, maybe, Craig, you could mute Patricia from your end. I don't know whether you can. Um, um, necessary. Uh, but, um, but anyway, it's a very great pleasure, therefore, to welcome um, um, uh, uh, Philip Mansell to give his talk. Thank you. Tell me, take me to call Daniela. Call Daniela. <laughs> Okay. Timothy, okay. please um, call Daniela quickly. Um, um, if everybody could mute their system, I'd be very grateful. Um, so, Philip Mansell, the floor is yours. And do not forget his latest book, King of the World. You must buy this one. Okay, it relates very much to this talk as well. Thank you, Philip. Thank you very much, Craig and David and the Anglo-Turkish Society for this invitation. I'm speaking tonight on the lily and the crescent, Christ. Louis XIV and the Ottoman Empire, there we are. Nice culture, leave it alone. commerce and crusades. And let's forget about national history. All history has been far too nationalized, British history, French history. Actually, in Europe, so many countries were interlocked they cannot be understood. I wouldn't mind asking her. <laughs> and somebody has written, there's no such thing as French history. There is only European history. And I think this particularly applies to Louis XIV and the Ottoman Empire. He inherited a traditional alliance with the Ottoman Empire, symbolized, begun by these two fine Call gentlemen, her. Francis I on the left and Suleiman the Magnificent on the right who became allies, or for the much of Europe, partners in crime in the 1530s, as they joined forces, military and naval forces, against the massive world empire of Charles V. They had uh, campaigns together and naval campaigns together in the Mediterranean. So although both monarchies played the religious card when it suited them. Oh, the King of France is the eldest son of the church. He's going to go on a crusade to Jerusalem. Oh, the Ottoman Sultan is Caliph of the Muslims. He's going to conquer the lands of the unbelievers. But this was partly just uh, Daniela, a discourse. It was too dreadful. They really I had my picture on with, up on the screen. Uh, with and here you see the Ottoman. No, I want the big picture. The no, I do. The 14th. Patricia, don't. We can and still hear you. I'm very sorry, Mr. Mansell, but I just had to say it. And the factors that brought France and the Ottoman Empire together were enmity to Austria, trade, the trade above all of Marseille with the Ottoman Empire, and the king's desire to protect the. The, can, can you see my cursor? Yes. Pilgrims going to Jerusalem, which is a constant of the 17th and 18th centuries. There were always pilgrims going to Jerusalem and the holy sites, the church of the Nativity in Bethlehem and of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. And you see how very, very large the Ottoman Empire was. Of course, France was bound to want it as an ally. 
And here you see an, an early treaty, both in French and Ottoman, from 1604 between Henri IV and Ahmed II, printed in Ottoman in Paris. So there's already considerable knowledge of Ottoman and Arabic in Paris, and it is to this day one of the centers of knowledge about uh, of those languages. You see there's already a, an imprimerie of oriental languages, Arabic, Turkish and Persian. And we think of the young Louis XIV, here he is as Apollo in the Ballet of the Night, 1653, he promises to go off to Byzantium and destroy the Crescent. But this was just a pious or an impious hope. In reality, he was bound by this traditional French alliance with the Ottoman Empire. Here he is again as an emperor of the Romans, a really ambitious king bent on conquest in the 1660s. And here he is, uh, an early Ottoman ambassador. The Ottomans, contrary to a widely spread myth, they did send envoys and ambassadors to Western powers, particularly to Venice, occasionally to France. Here is a rather low-ranking Ottoman envoy speaking to Mr. de Leon, the foreign secretary of Louis XIV, and Leon is proclaiming to him, the king, my mas master, governs himself, he sees everything, he understands everything, and he orders everything. And nowhere was he more concerned than in commerce. Here is Marseille, which the king, although it had been rebellious, protects, he encourages the trade, he makes it a free port, he makes it one of the largest ports in the Mediterranean, and the city expands during Louis XIV's reign. The trade expands. It's one of the most important, the Ottoman Empire is probably the most important single trading partner of France. Exports of cloth, imports of silk, uh, rare products, spices, coffee, and so on. Here you see the port of Marseille a little bit later by Vernet and some of the figures in the port are of course Turks. Mm -hmm. Armenians settled in Marseille at this time. Coffee comes to France, to Paris through Marseille in the 1660s and 1670s for the first time. Many very complicated negotiations constantly uh, protected French merchants in the Ottoman Empire were protected by the capitulations and the treaties, which were renewed in Louis XIV's reign in 1673. And another great port, this is a very famous picture of Smyrna on the western coast of Anatolia. There are French merchants there, wonderful descriptions of the trade of Smyrna, of the freedom of the merchants in both western travel books and Evlia Celebi. Evlia Celebi complains that if there's any row between a merchant and a Turk of Izmir, then the consul's police appears and it becomes a dark frank place. And I quote, and of course they had the law courts which could judge these disputes. And one trade, very flourishing, in the reign of Louis XIV, it's the slave trade. And rather amazingly, although he's an ally of the Ottoman Empire, and he, he uses this word ally and alliance in his uh, negotiations with the Ottomans. But the consuls of France in Ottoman ports were expected to supply the French Navy with slaves, even with Turkish slaves. Acheté des Turcs. So how this happened, well, while the Ottoman Empire was so strong, I don't know. But each consul in the Levant was obliged to supply 50 Turkish slaves a year. Wow. Mm -hmm. And 1674, the Marquis de Nointel, who has just negotiated a new agreement between France and the Ottoman Empire, he goes on a grand tour of the empire with copies of the agreement which he shows to local governors to make sure 
that the very generous protection for merchants and priests is enforced. And here is a wonderful view of Athens, then an Ottoman city with many mosques, as you can see. The Acropolis is in perfect, the Parthenon is in perfect condition, not yet bombarded by the Venetians. And here is the ambassador, Mr. de Nuantel, his brother, his party, his servants, his equerry, touring the Ottoman Empire. And this is the best early picture of Athens, and it's been very kindly lent by the Museum of Chartres to the Museum of the City of Athens. And these are drawings by Jacques Carré, one of the ambassador's artists, of the sculpture on the Parthenon. The best early drawings of the sculpture of the Parthenon are due to Louis XIV's ambassador. And of course they had plans to buy them, but they didn't, they weren't Elgin's a hundred years early. Um, but they were constantly buying, hoovering up any antiquities going in the Ottoman Empire and manuscripts and ancient Greek and Roman cameos. And the Galerie des Glaces in Versailles was decorated partly with sculpture bought from Smyrna. More drawings. And this is, we're going to Jerusalem. This is a very rare early vestment given either by Louis XIV or Louis XIII to the Franciscan monks who protected the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. You see the royal arms of France and Navarre, the Holy Spirit descending on the King of France. All such vestments were destroyed during the French Revolution or had been destroyed through the force of fashion. So only in the safe protection of the Ottoman Empire have they survived. This was shown at an amazing exhibition in Versailles, which also showed the documents, the protection uh, given by the Ottoman sultans to French priests and merchants. And here is an amazing discovery in a Paris flat, now above the offices of Oscar de la Renta in the Rue de Marignan, off the Champs-Élysées, when the situation gets better, you can all go and see it. It is a lost picture of Nuantel with his party in front of Jerusalem. Again, the first early and accurate picture of Jerusalem. You can see the Dome of the Rock here. Here is Nuantel, his embassy, his brother, and the Janissaries and grooms protecting his party. Here you see a detail another detail. It is an extraordinary picture. These pictures were commissioned by Nuantel, painted in Istanbul, presumably from sketches taken on the spot, and then moved back to Paris to commemorate such a glorious event as being Louis XIV's ambassador to the Sublime Port. Here you see him again. He was a rather successful ambassador, but later when Kara Mustafa Pasha becomes Grand Vizier, the Grand Vizier who tried to take Vienna and the Ottoman Empire is particularly difficult. There is always these relations between two powers have to be seen through the eyes of etiquette. There was an etiquette dispute over, over whether the ambassador of Louis XIV had the power to put his stool or tabouret on the sofa or the raised platform on which the Grand Vizier himself sat. These matters really mattered at the time and the Grand Vizier refused him so this privilege. So he was withdrawn from the Ottoman Empire. But after the failure to take Vienna, when the Ottoman Empire was weaker, then it allowed foreign ambassadors the privilege of having their stool on the level with the Grand Vizier on his sofa. Here you see him again, again, this extraordinary view of Jerusalem, really quite accurate. Here is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. There is Al-Aqsa Mosque. And 1683, this is John Sobieski, the King of Poland. Normally, he was an ally of Louis XIV. French-Polish friendship was already 
quite well established. But in 1683, much to Louis XIV's dislike, he helps the Austrian emperor defend Vienna. And here he is crushing Turks. Here you see the defeat of the Turkish army. The balance of power shifts. And despite what he said about wanting to protect Christendom, Louis XIV did really encourage the Ottoman advance into Austria. He told his ambassadors, oh, I do nothing to encourage it, but he did. And his, his main intermediary with the Ottoman government is always the French ambassador in Constantinople. He didn't necessarily want a Turkish victory, but he wanted a constant warfare between the Ottoman Empire and the Holy Roman Emperor based in Vienna, so that they, their forces would be absorbed. And meanwhile, he could do a mopping up operation of French targets in the Rhineland, like Strasbourg, which he took in 1682, Luxembourg, which he took in 1684, and the Palatinate, which he ravaged in 1688. That is what really mattered to him. And I'll be coming to some uh, quotes about this incredible correspondence, which I've had the privilege to look at in the French diplomatic archives in Paris. And 1686, the Ottoman Empire is doing badly. Austrian armies, after taking, after defeating them outside Vienna, they have taken Budapest. They are advancing deep into the Balkans. And the French diplomatic correspondence shows there is pa panic, at least according to the French ambassador, in Constantinople. There is talk of leaving for Asia. There is a feeling in the chancelleries of Europe that the Ottoman Empire might collapse. So what does Louis XIV do? He has a second foreign policy. In theory, he is an ally of the Ottoman Empire, but he has an, uh, uh, a what-if policy. Okay, if the Ottoman Empire collapses, what is France going to get? What's my share of the booty? So he sends a naval mission under Monsieur Dortier round the Mediterranean to make drawings of various key positions and ports. And um, here you see so some of the best and most accurate drawings of Ottoman cities are now in the archives of the French Navy Ministry. They're in the archives of the French Navy Ministry, because it wasn't an official diplomatic mission, it is a naval mission, not controlled by the ambassador in Constantinople. And so they draw the great city of Aleppo, which was familiar to Louis XIV, because one of his courtiers was also French consul in Aleppo, Monsieur Davia, whose memoirs published in 1735 should really be translated into English. They're a wonderful picture of how a great international city like Aleppo worked with every bit of the machinery fitting into other bits of the machinery, guilds, janissaries, the governor, the French consul, other consuls, the merchants, and so on, to produce profit for everybody. So here is Aleppo. Here is a wonderful view of Constantinople. There was a plan, maybe France should take Constantinople, kill all the Muslim Turks, enslave those who survived, and forget about the complaints of Marseille. This is the language spoken in these secret reports from the naval mission. You see how well it's drawn. It's drawn by technical military and naval draftsmen. And here you see a view of the port of Tripoli in Lebanon, very well drawn, as it would have appeared to a naval commander if he's leading French ships to attack it. Tripoli, which had once been the capital of a crusader county, the county of Tripoli, ruled by the Count of Toulouse. And curiously enough, a lot of old books about the Kingdom of Jerusalem did, and about the Byzantine Emperor are reprinted at this time 
under Louis XIV. This is probably the first accurate view of Tripoli. And here is Side, Sidon, where St. Louis himself had once stayed in the 13th century. St. Louis, the great hero of the French monarchy. And you see how well it's drawn with the surviving Crusader castles clearly shown. And where there are jetties, where it would be good for a French ship to moor. And here is a plan of the fort of Alexandria, when the party of draftsmen la landed in Alexandria, they were attacked by a local crowd, which quite rightly suspected them of being spies. And since they're working for the French Ministry of Marine, see how beautifully decorated all these plans are. Hopefully there will be a book about them soon. Um, Faruk Bilci has already published most of them. And here you see another view of Alexandria, a great international port still trading with Egypt, a lot of ships off it. And there was a, 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 a French consul called Monsieur Feuillet who wanted to um, get local antiquities for Louis XIV's glorious park in Versailles. He, he couldn't do that, but he wrote a very good description of Egypt a hundred years before uh, Napoleon's and Denon's. And he's an early believer that men and were like animals, and he said men descended from fish. So there were some very remarkable and uh, skeptical servants of Louis XIV. Here is the port of Rosetta in Egypt. And then they go on to Greek islands. This is the island of, this is the town of Paros, on the island of Paros. You see it's detailed down to the last windmills. And at this time, he, Louis XIV has a, a third foreign policy. He's also, without telling his Ottoman allies, in touch with local Christians and taking them under his protection if they become Catholics or if they acknowledge the authority of the Pope. So at the same time, under Louis XIV, a group of Greek Catholics emerges in the islands of the Aegean, Armenian Catholics in Eastern Anatolia, protected by French missionaries and consuls, and uh, what were called Greek Catholics, uh, really Arab Catholics in Aleppo, where there's a great French missionary presence among local Christians, and the whole Orthodox community of Aleppo goes into schism from the 1680s, some of them accepting the authority of the Pope. And these Greek Catholics later, who often had a better education, are at the origin of the Arabic literary revival beginning in the 18th century. So it's all happening under Louis XIV. He also accepts some local Christians from Egypt and from Syria as students in Paris. So it's the beginning of the French, of a small and later larger French speaking Christian group in the Levant, looking towards Paris and France and often being given scholarships there. And here you see the island of Milo, again, very well drawn And, but it's not all happiness in the relations between Louis XIV and the Ottoman Empire. This shows Père Levache, the French consul in Algiers, being fired from a cannon because there's constant disputes and rows, partly over the slave trade. French ships, as I've told you, were raiding or buying uh, Turkish slaves and, of course, the ships of Algiers, Tunis, and Tripoli of Barbary, Tripoli in what's now Libya, were also raiding French shipping. And there's so many raids that Ottoman shipping, at this from this time, begins often, often Ottoman merchants begin to entrust their ships, their goods, to French ships, so that they won't be raided by French ships. So it's a sort of 
blackmailing relationship. And this is this firing of the poor consul is a result of a French bombardment of Algiers, of which there were six or seven in the reign of Louis the Fourteenth. They all say there were long periods of peace when they exchanged presents. Uh, Louis the Fourteenth would give the ruler of Algiers Gobelin's tapestries, and he would be given wild animals and so on. And when the French invaded Algeria in 1830, they took this great cannon, which had been made in the 16th century and had been used for the defense of Algiers and installed it in Brest. And here it is today. It's called La Consulaire, the cannon which used to defend Algiers on the seafront of Brest in Brittany. And now apparently the Algerian government has requested its return as forbidden booty. So warfare, uh, there's war in the 1690s between France and the Holy Roman Emperor and there's warfare in 1702 to 1713 between France, England, the Holy Roman Emperor and the Ottoman Empire is still uh, uh, was fighting the Austrians in the 1690s. It makes peace in 1699. But here is a figure who straddles the two worlds. He's Ferenc Rakudzi, Prince of Transylvania. He's an Ottoman tributary and also an ally of Louis XIV, who fights constantly the Habsburgs in Hungary and Austria, and then later comes back with a group of Hungarians and Transylvanians to France. He's very well received by Louis XIV in Versailles. His followers form the first Hussar regiments in the French army. And then later, as part of the continuing strategy of the French government, he goes back to the Ottoman Empire and is a refugee in Rodosto, or what is now Tekiadah on the Sea of Marmara. And here is his house in Tekiadah. And it is still a place of pilgrimage for Hungarian and Transylvanian patriots. Here is the map of Europe. You see how very important the Ottoman Empire was. The Austrian monarchy equally powerful and France and the Ottoman Empire remain more or less allies throughout this period. Uh, Rakudzi had been Prince of Transylvania here, then he goes through Danzig to Versailles and then again back to Tekiadah on the Sea of Marmara. And this diplomatic uh, military relationship is extremely complex and um, I'd just like to quote to you some of the ambassador's dispatches. 1686, the French ambassador, to show how close the two countries were, writes, the sublime port have never yet refused me anything for which I asked. And that anything also includes wheat supplies, Ottoman wheat often saved France from starvation, for example, in 1709. So agriculture in the Ottoman Empire was probably a lot more efficient and productive than we think. 1688, the chief interpreter of the sublime port, Alexander Mavrocordata, is in fact rec receiving an annual pension from Louis XIV. So he's got a finger in every pie. And the Sultan writes to Louis XIV to praise the friendship, goodwill and good relations that for long existed between your parents and grandparents and the Empress, my forefathers, has since been augmented and fortified. And there is a curious myth then around, at least in government circles or at least for Western consumption, that in the 14th century or the 15th century, there'd been an Ottoman French royal marriage and that helped explain the um, alliance. 
26th of May, 1688, the French ambassador writes, the contempt the militias and the people have conceived for the Sultan is increasing daily. If the Austrians advance as far as Constantinople, the route to which is open to them, nothing can guarantee this empire from a total collapse. This habit of European diplomats to think the Ottoman Empire is about to collapse. But according to the ambassador, the city was a desert. All the shops had shut. People are leaving for Anatolia. The French, if the Ottoman government supplied France with wheat, so the French ambassador helped supply Constantinople with grain also. And he prophesied that either through internal revolts or external attacks, October 1688, the fall and entire decadence of the Ottoman Empire is inevitable. And that is one reason why in October 1688, as William III, Prince of Orange, has gathered a European army and is crossing the channel and landing in Devon in November 1688 to overthrow his father-in-law, James II, what's called the Glorious Revolution. Louis XIV doesn't stop him, doesn't send the French Navy, doesn't send a French army to Amsterdam as he might have done. In fact, he's focusing on the Ottoman Empire and he's launching French troops into the Holy Roman Empire to draw off Austrian and German forces, which otherwise, in his opinion, might have reached Constantinople. And the Ottoman Empire, the Grand Vizier, sort of mocking the king, he said, You're, he accuses him of staying on the Rhine with his arms folded. Therefore, on the 10th of September, Louis XIV formally promises that he will march his troops on the Rhine. And he does indeed do that. He burns and destroys a lot of cities. And he boasts in a dispatch of the 15th of October, 1688, there is a general war in Europe. He's proud of it. And he thinks the Turks should profit from it by recovering what they had lost in Hungary. Use this information adroitly, he wrote to his ambassador, Mr. de Girardin, to stop the Turks precipitating a peace. And this is the extreme of cynicism. He's saying peace, which in reality, au fond in French, would be even more prejudicial to Christianity than to themselves by facilitating to the House of Austria the means to increase its power, ruin Catholic states and the great archbishoprics of Germany. And he, he denies that he's exciting the Turks against the emperor, but he continually did so. And this goes on throughout the 1680s and 90s. I, I quote these to show you how everything is interlocked. The glorious revolution in England partly depends on the Ottoman-French alliance and the situation of Constantinople. And in fact, the Ottoman Empire survives and it makes the epoch-making peace of Karlovitz in 1699, which makes a sort of equal balance between the Austrian and Ottoman empires in the Balkans. And there's a, then a period of peace. How was this alliance maintained? Partly through an army of merchants, diplomats and scholars who are sort of intermediaries between the two systems and who know the Ottoman Empire extremely well. So the amount of information stored in French diplomatic archives and in French books is really extremely impressive. And I want to show you some of these books and authors. Here is Tevano, who wrote a travel book about the Ottoman Empire in the 1670s. Here he is again painted by Philippe de Champagne, a rather fantasy dress, but it sure looked good when you're showing off to your neighbors and colleagues in France. And this is Monsieur, uh, I've just forgotten his name. It's another, it's a jeweler of Louis XIV, who, who Jean-Baptiste Tavernier, who wrote travel books about the Ottoman Empire, Persia, and the Mughal Empire. He's roaming Asia, 
to get better jewels for Louis XIV because another thing linking the different monarchies of France and the Ottoman Empire, there's a shared love of splendor, of hierarchy and of jewels. And he wrote very well about it. This is his portrait by La Gilière, but he's a Protestant, so he has to leave in 1685 and he goes to live in Switzerland. Les Six Voyages de Monsieur Tervernier is a very fascinating book. And here is a book about Constantinople by Monsieur Grelot. And you see the king's involvement. It's presented to the king and it's published with official royal approval. And the book contains plans and illustrations. And Louis XIV would talk to travelers during his public lunch or dinner at Versailles. He was fascinated by other countries and he would talk to them and ask for more information or give them his blessing as they're setting off for Syria or Siam or China or wherever they're going. So Versailles isn't a world of its own, it's a global hub. Everybody is coming through or leaving. People coming and going the whole time. And here you see the dedication and there's a wonderful dedication saying that uh, of course it is the duty of the King of France to spread the cross of Jesus Christ wherever he can, the Ottoman Empire, Siam or China. And the cross of Jesus Christ really is, I think, shorthand for the French rule. And this is the memoirs of the Chevalier d'Avieux, who is a French diplomat in 1671 in Istanbul. He helps draw up the capitulations and he's also consul at different times in Aleppo, Algiers, Tripoli and other uh, ports of the Levant. He learned Turkish, he's frequently at Versailles and he's frequently in the Ottoman Empire. He knows Louis XIV. Louis XIV tells him, at least according to Davia, you'll be very pleased with this journey, you'll see your good friends, you love me enough not to suffer in all that you negotiate with the sublime port. Goodbye, monsieur. Go well satisfied and may God guard you. Stay well. Have a good journey. And on his return, he would entertain Louis XIV and Madame de Montespan with his account of Turkish marriage customs. It, this book needs to be a, a shorter edition. It's six volumes. It needs to be translated into English. And here is an, another aspect of the relationship is botanical. This is a great botanist, Monsieur Piton de Tournefort, who is sent by Louis XIV round Anatolia, the islands of the Aegean and so on. And he returned in about 1702 with 1,352 unknown botanical specimens for the Jardin du Roi in Paris. And of course a famous book is The Thousand and One Nights. This is written by Antoine Galland, who is a French scholar who lived in the French embassy in Istanbul and it's dedicated to a lady-in-waiting of Louis XIV's granddaughter-in-law. And of course it makes these tales extremely popular. It has a succès fou in France and later every other European country. They're very popular in the 18th century and the king or other people during carnival masquerades would dress up as Turks. And also there's another aspect of the relationship. There's a constant exchange of horses the rulers of Algiers or merchants in Aleppo are constantly sending horses back to France. And then this very famous book, the Book of Prints by Van Moor, who is, actually has a formal title, Peintre Ordinaire du Roi en Levant, 
the official painter of the King of France in the Levant. He's working in and for the French embassy. And on the orders of Monsieur de Ferriol, he draws different costumes and professions in Constantinople. And Ferriol, who goes out as ambassador in 1699, he's a very curious person. He, he offends etiquette by trying to go and present his respects to the Sultan with a sword tied to his belt as if he was at Versailles where every gentleman wore a sword. This was forbidden in the Ottoman palace. There is an actual physical struggle at the gates of the throne room, the throne room you see in Topkapi Palace today, and he is forced to leave, i.e. humiliation, breakdown of etiquette rules. But for the next 10 years, he remains as ambassador in the port, i.e. the relationship is too big to fail. It's too important. Even though he's offended the court, he's still there doing whatever he has to do. Getting, it's he who organizes different Ottoman merchants from different ports to send grain shipments to Marseille. And he also commissions these wonderful pictures, which are the root of all Turkey pictures subsequently in Europe. Here you see the Sultan himself and Van Moor. He lives in Istanbul and he does occasionally accompany ambassadors to the audiences in the palace. So he does know what he's drawing. Here you see the different types. It's now in the Turkish cabinet in the Rijksmuseum. These were all collected by the Dutch ambassador and left as a group to the Dutch uh, Levant company uh, and later they ended up in the Rijksmuseum. You see a whirling dervish, a black eunuch, a janissary, uh, a, a lady from the Greek islands, uh, the Sultan, the Grand Vizier and so on. I deeply recommend a visit to this room when you're in Amsterdam. Here you see other versions, they would all be copied. Um, constantly other versions for other ambassadors, the black eunuch, and these are ladies of different Greek islands, a Bulgarian shepherd, and so on. Um, more people, troops, a Greek priest, maybe the patriarch, an interpreter, a black eunuch, um, another interpreter, more ladies, ladies walking. Here you see the Bulgarian shepherd, the uh, a janissary, a whirling dervish, a complete pictorial record of the Ottoman Empire for the French market. It's, it's really these diplomatic paintings commissioned by different ambassadors in Istanbul. They deserve a book on what well, they have been written about already. The, the incredible collections for the French ambassador, the Polish ambassador, the Swedish ambassador, the Venetian ambassador, and many others. Uh, a dancing boy, a lady. And you see here Patrona Halil, 1730, the leader of the first modern popular rebellion in Turkish history. So you see Van Moor isn't an outsider, he's also an insider, or else how else would he have been able to paint this popular figure who's master of the city for a few months until he gets his head chopped off on the orders of the next Grand Vizier. And here you see the children of Monsieur Dondrezel in 1724. It's at the height of the French Ottoman alliance. The, his two sons are being received by the Grand Vizier in the Divan Hane. Here is a very, very large party of diplomats, travelers, and merchants accompanying the ambassador. And it's then that the Grand Vizier says that French Ottoman friendship should go on for all time. He wishes Louis XV a reign as long and successful as that of Louis XIV. If there is any difference between our two kingdoms, 
it is only religion. He's almost, he's trying, at least according to the French account, he's trying to dismiss religion as a factor. And in fact, the French have just made, helped be negotiators for a peace between the Ottoman Empire and Persia and these diplomatic audiences as I'm sure you know were regularly renewed and the ambassador would have a kaftan, he would be dined and his clothes would be perfumed. Uh, there were also a few humiliating aspects but on the whole these audiences were meant to show friendship between the Ottoman Empire and its, its European neighbours and according to the French ambassador he always got the best kaftan and the most honours. Here you see him again with his sons, two small figures, being received by Ahmed III in the throne room. And Louis XIV goes on being this great international monarch uh, thinking of French expansion everywhere and here in the, his last diplomatic reception February 1715 in the Galerie des Glaces in Versailles when he wears a coat so heavy with jewels that he could hardly walk he's trying to show that France is as rich and powerful as ever and he's receiving the Persian ambassador because there's also French-Persian friendship and what are they discussing? They're discussing a trade treaty and also a joint naval action in the Persian Gulf against local Arab rulers. So already the Persian or Arabian Gulf is a key um, strategic area in the world. And later there's more Ottoman embassies to France. Here is Saeed Mehmet Effendi being in, received in the Tuileries Gardens, 1721. Here he is, a portrait that's just appeared on the London market. Hopefully it'll go to Turkey. Here is his son who comes in 1742, is formally received by Louis XV again in the Galerie des Glaces because it's such an important event uh, painted by Van Loo and this French Ottoman friendship goes on throughout the 18th century and there's a new book by Carter Findlay about uh, the wonderful Tableau General de l'Empire Ottoman which was began to be published in 1787 in Paris. Another extraordinarily detailed and accurate picture of the state of the Ottoman Empire. Here you see Madame de Pompadour painted as a harem lady, fashion for Tiokari. And this is the, some of the last pictures. This is a lady of Pera who marries the French ambassador, Monsieur de Vergen, who is committed who is ambassador for about 10 years in Constantinople in up to 1768 and he commits France to the Ottoman alliance and the preservation of the Ottoman Empire. She later comes back to live in Versailles and here is Vergen himself in Ottoman dress painted by Favre in Istanbul in 1768. I don't think he ever wore this dress except to be painted in a portrait which would impress everybody back home. And these portraits have now been bought from Vergen's descendants and can be seen in the Musée de Pera in Istanbul. And here is a, a print from a book of 1784. It shows the garden of the French embassy looking at Istanbul itself again showing this, it's almost a representation of the alliance, the closeness, at least on the certain levels, between the two powers. And finally, this is a symbol of the Crimean alliance when France, England and Turkey joined together to fight Russia. As, as I've tried to show, 
France and Turkey had always been allies in the reign of Louis XIV. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Philip. It was wonderful. Now, who would like to ask the first question? Um, well, perhaps I could just begin then. Uh, thank you very much. H how would you see your presentation fitting into Noel Malcolm's uh, recent work on the overlaps between Italy and the Venetian Empire in, in the Ottoman Empire? Did you see parallels between your work and his? Yes, well, he, he's done much more archival research than, than I have and is a much better linguist than I am. But yes, between Venice and the Ottoman Empire, and of course there is this devastating mid-17th century war over Crete between Venice and the Ottoman Empire, which changes a lot. There are many parallels. What I would say is because of the French court and monarchy being so adventurous and keen on novelty, I think the, le the level of the French books and the amount of French exploration and just buying antiquities is far higher than that of the Venetian equivalents. I don't know if many Venetian scholars or travelers were buying antiquities for the Senate of Venice in Syria in the 1670s. And when I've read Venetian accounts, they're very good, they're very detailed, they're very accurate, but <laughs> they're slightly dry and official. There's, there's not the individuality of, say, Arvia or Petit de la Croix or Thévenot or others, and not the humour, even in French diplomatic dispatches that you get. And, and of course, not the, the military and naval closeness that you get in the 1680s and thereafter between France and the Ottoman Empire, because Venice is, is, is an enemy. There's the war over Crete, and then later there's the war over the Peloponnese up to 1715, when, by the way, the Greeks of the Peloponnese really preferred Turkish rule to Venetian rule. They found it less tiresome and annoying. So Venice is, in my opinion, more, more limited and more down to earth, let's say. Mm. And of course, the British one, uh, of course, there's recalled, but after that, it's, it's, um, um, it, you know, there isn't anything like the riches that there's a French one, as you say. It, it, there, in the 18th century, maybe we get some. S sorry? Uh, comparing the British with the French interaction. Yeah. In, in Again, I think it's, and uh, there's no great artistic patron until, until really, I think, Sir Robert Ainsley and Luigi Maya in the late 18th century. There's mm -hmm. much less artistic patronage. There's no equivalent to Van Moore's book and the book of Prince. The English are borrowing from France as they did in many other fields. Um, though, of course, there are wonderful English travel accounts. George Sands in the early 17th century, merchants going to Aleppo are very individual. Yes. Fewer, yes. fewer pictures. Yes, yes, there there's early pilgrimage accounts as well um, from the early 17th century. But but please, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, we'll try and do this informally. So if you'd like to ask a question, um, and please just go ahead and address our speaker. Um, Shebnam, if you want to go ahead, Shebnam. I think it's possibly me as using Shebnam's account as well. So okay, James. Good. Yeah, go for I it. Know, okay. it's right. James. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, Philip, I, I have a question. Um, what came across for me from your talk was how much the system at that time operated on the balance of power and France was naturally aligned with the Habsburg rival, the Ottomans. And it struck me how, what a contrast it is today where you have the French daggers drawn with the Turks. Um, and I just wonder whether you had any reflections on how much has changed. I mean, the, it seems that the entire structure of the balance of power is different now with the, with the uh, French aligned with the Germans against the Turks rather than, rather than what you might consider the more natural um, uh, balance of power that they had at that period. 
Well, there's many, many differences, I agree. And, and in all the French discussions about relations with Turkey, this incredible historic alliance and friendship, which practically saved Francois Premier in the 16th century, it's never mentioned. It's almost always forgotten. And, but of course, you do have a very different sort of Turkish government at the moment, which maybe is less pra pragmatic and flexible than the Ottoman Empire was, particularly when the Ottoman Empire needed a friend. And you have Greece, you have the European Union, and you have uh, Germany, as you say, and you have uh, Erdogan. So perhaps French, uh, bad French relation, and you have Macron playing to his voters. So that may be another explanation for the difference. And there's, there's also... The King of France just went ahead and did what he wanted with the Ottoman Empire, not paying attention to public opinion at all. And, and always saying at the same time, oh, I'm only doing it for the good of the Catholic Church so I can protect holy sites in Jerusalem. But really, it's for grand international strategy. Might I ask, um, since uh, that was a wonderful talk, since you're talking about the 16th century, the Battle of Lepanto, yes. um, what impact, I'm just trying to, because that was, was it mainly Venice versus the Turks, or the, the French didn't have any galleys in the no. battle? No, Lepanto is Spain, Malta and Venice against the Turks. Uh, France is going through the wars of religion, but of course, basically, they're friends of the Ottoman Empire. They don't dare say so. And there was even a plan between Catherine de Medici and the Sublime Port to put one of her sons to rule Algiers or something like that. And there's very good French diplomatic reports from Constantinople. I think there was a French ambassador in Constantinople at the time of the Battle of Lepanto. So there's a holy alliance against the Ottoman Empire, but very Catholic France is not part of it. Yes, thank you. Um, Daniel Ohanian, please, would you like to ask a question? Sure, yes, thank you. Um, I should say first, I'm not a member of your society, so I was glad for the opportunity to uh, join you from Los Angeles uh, over video this way. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Mansell, I have a... Um, uh, a question about the um, the person and style of Louis the Fourteenth. Um, to use maybe an acronistic language, could you tell us about um, the management style of Louis XIV? I wonder, within the context of French Ottoman relations, do you have? Is it possible to know um, whether um, Louis was generally involved more in the big picture, or was he very involved in the minutiae of what his uh, representatives were doing there? He's a micromanager. He's obsessed with details. He reads these diplomatic dispatches. We think of him dancing or fighting. Actually, he spends most of his time in a room with ministers or officials, and often in Madame de Maintenon's room, going through papers, trying to make decisions. He's comp and nothing interests him more than international diplomacy, stirring up Turkey to resist Austria, and so on. So he, he, and he claimed that he read every single diplomatic dispatch, and it's perfectly possible. And he makes comments in the margin sometimes, but often uh, somebody else does that for him. He's, he's a control freak particularly um, diplomacy. And he gets, after 1680 or 1683, when Colbert, his great trade minister, the one who wanted every French consul in the Ottoman Empire to supply 50 Turkish galley slaves every year, on con without that, they would lose their jobs. I think this was, I can't believe this was enforced in practice. But after Colbert dies in 1683, he, and Louvois di dies in 1691, he's more and more in control of the whole government machine, and often catastrophically, because he's trying to do too many things at the same time, and he's not relieving the tax burden, the climate, there's terrible harvests and terrible winters. So French armies are defeated from 1704, Blenheim, partly because French soldiers are just weaker and shorter than British or German soldiers. Um, and he's saved by a miracle, a change of government in England in 1712. He's, he's, he's 
as much of a control freak as Philip II of Spain or a modern ruler. So does he travel much at all? I mean, his, did he ever go to Marseille? Or I know he went into Germ uh, the German yes. lands. He's, he's much more of a traveler than we think. He went everywhere in France, except probably Auvergne and Dauphiné. And he had been as a young man to Marseille in 1660, when it had been rebellious, and he enters Marseille through a breach in the walls to show he's conquered it. Mm. And he's rude to the local authorities. But later, he really looks after Marseille to make it a global port. He's very aware of trying to catch up with London and Amsterdam. And to a certain extent, France does. And he, he travels all around France, and then he travels to Alsace and to Dunkirk and Calais. He visited five or six times. That shows mm. what sort of man he was. So I think he knew France better than any head of state until when Napoleon would just nip through. He wouldn't talk to local officials, really, because he's on campaign. Any head of state until the age of railways, I think. Mm. He's not stuck in Versailles. Jeffrey Parker's book, Global Crisis, points up what you were saying about the 1690s. And the, I think, doesn't he say something like two million out of 10 million Frenchmen died or something in the cold weather? I think it was about one million out of, out of more, say, say 18 or 20 million in 1693 mm. to four. And then again in 1709, rather less. But somehow the population always recovered and somehow France always got back on its feet. And curiously enough, miserable as the state of French peasants and farmers was, they never bothered to emigrate to Canada or Louisiana, although the government encouraged them to do so. They wanted to stay in France. And, and in the 18th century, there are moments of boom. And before the revolution, French trade is almost overtaking English trade. You can see the 18th century architecture in Bordeaux and Nantes and so on. And it's the revolution and the wars of Napoleon that really push it back. Mm. Elif, I think you've got a question. Yes, um, thank you. I was wondering whether when the Ottomans um, started backing the Protestants, whether that affected relations with France? Well, that's a very good question. With the French, because strategy comes first, thus in the 16th century, they're supporting Protestant German princes because they're anti-Austria and anti-Habsburgs, who are the real enemies of France. And in the 17th century, then French policy becomes more Catholic. And in fact, there are some rather good travel books on Monsieur Dumont, I think it is, on the Ottoman Empire, written by Huguenot refugees from France. But it doesn't, religion, uh, sort of religion becomes less important with its relationship with the Ottoman Empire and even with German princes. So there are times when France is allied to Brandenburg, although it is Protestant, because it's anti-Habsburg. Uh, and France is always an ally of Sweden, although it's Protestant. And France and the Ottoman Empire together support Charles XII of Sweden in his fight against Peter the Great and Russia. So that's, it's, that's another aspect of this very complex relationship which comes to the fore in the late 18th century. It's a triangular relationship, France, Sweden and the Ottoman Empire, ancient allies together against the rising, first against Austria and later against the rising power of Russia. It is very, um, it's, it's amazing how much it, things are so interconnected, but there's still, yes. in spite of the differences, that in, there's still in spite, differences. Of, in spite of the differences, and they're interconnected diplomatically, militarily, and these amazing travel books. So there's a French officer goes to Charles XII's camp in 
Bender in the Ottoman territory in 1710 and 11 and writes a full description, which he dedicates to Louis XIV's sister-in-law, Madame. They knew what was going on. Yeah. Thank you. Do we have any more questions from the floor, please? Do you think the alliance between Sweden and Istanbul even went back to the Viking janissaries or that far back? No, that, that's where they're supplying men for the Varangian guard and mm. the Byzantine emperors. No, but it, it does go far back. 1650s is a print of a, there's already an Ottoman embassy going to Stockholm. Can you imagine the difficulty of that journey then? Because they are frightened of both of enemies of Austria and this rising power of Russia, which is beginning even before Peter the Great. It is confirmed in the early 18th century when Charles XII really becomes an Ottoman protégé and he's financed by the Ottoman Empire and it is strengthened by trade, diplomacy and these two bachelor brothers who are successive Swedish ambassadors in Istanbul, the Selsing brothers who commission pictures, who have textiles, who have secret accounts of the Ottoman Empire and their pictures have just been sold by their descendants. I saw them all together in a wooden manor house in the middle of Sweden and now they are locked in a uh, depot in Qatar airport and the Qatar museum swear as they're going to be exhibited one day but I see no sign of that yet. They really are a priceless record of 18th century Istanbul, the gardens, the people and the Bosphorus and so on, all done by, I cannot remember the name, a name like Van, Van der Noot and Brian Taylor wrote an article and did a talk about these paintings for the Levantine Heritage Foundation. Hopefully one day they will be exhibited, perhaps even be shown outside Qatar. And then the climax is Muradja Dawson's Tableau General de l'Empire Ottoman because it's written by an Armenian Catholic of Istanbul in French, published in Paris, but he's also dragoman to the Swedish embassy. That's how he gets his diplomatic protection. He's an insider outsider with very good sources in Istanbul and he later returns to Istanbul as Swedish ambassador in the 1790s. A three volume book published from 1787 to 1820. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do we have any more questions please? Yes please, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead David. Uh, well, I'd like basically just to go over the ground of the 18th century because there's a tipping point there. What you described and really, really was a brilliant and marvellous talk, which I'm very, very glad I managed to get to a bit belatedly. Thank you. But uh, it was the age of absolutism when both the, the fortunes of both empires are in the ascendant. In the 18th century, you see the decline. The French response to that is to help the Ottomans develop their military. I think I'm right. My mem memory of the 18th century is a little bit vague, but aren't, aren't all the artillery trains? and early so military reformers uh, yes. trying to be central in France in the 1730s. And then things, both sides get weak, the French rather more slowly against the British, and the Turks calamitously. 1774 you have the Treaty of Kuchukai Naja and the Russians break into the Black Sea and it's very clear that before long the Russians will be in Constantinople. This corresponds also to the partition of Poland and a lot of people see the Ottoman Empire as the next candidate for partition after Poland. And the French certainly go on thinking about that until the 1830s. I've somewhere got a book which describes French plans to partition, you know, not to partition, to annex Crete and settle 500,000 Frenchmen 
on Crete. Do you think that, ever, that could ever have happened, and perhaps did happen in an alter, alter, alternative universe, or do you think they simply didn't understand it? Because I think people were writing letters to the French government, I think you touched on it, uh, saying, you know, this is here for the taking. And of course, Napoleon did try to take it. Um, yes. Did you see this in the art? It, it reflected in any way, perhaps a decline in the prestige or perceptions of magnificence of uh, imperial, Ottoman imperial splendor? I think it's it's constantly changing between reigns in both in France and the Ottoman Empire. Some monarchs are interested in splendor, some aren't. I don't think Frenchmen would have gone to Crete, nor nor do I think the Cretan economy could have supported 500,000 Frenchmen. But there are plans for conquest. I forgot to say, in the 1680s and 70s, there are letters from Arab Christians in Aleppo and in Lebanon saying, what are you doing wasting your time on the Rhine? Come and liberate us. So already that plan is there. There's already a plan under Louis XIV to take Egypt if the empire collapses. Um, the French consul in Alexandria is encouraging this. Leibniz is encouraging this. They're playing on different registers all the time. But the, I think Vergen was a very superior ambassador and foreign minister. And he, he thought this was beyond France's strength, but they must build up the Ottoman Empire, as you say, with some military and naval advisors. So there's a naval, um, a naval tactical book is printed on the French embassy printing press in 1788, I think. Nobody had any idea that the French monarchy was about to collapse. They constantly say the Ottoman Empire is about to collapse, but they think they're going to go sailing on. I think it's a great shock when Louis says it proved as weak as he was. Again, it's partly due to a lack of bread. That's uh, in 1789, as we know, a shortage of bread and fear of famine. But also, both France and the Ottoman Empire, that united by friendship with Sweden, and also trying to protect Poland against partition. That is the cause of the 1768-74 war. France sends a few advisors, but it's trapped by this strategic problem, which it had under Louis XIV, and it has again in 1939 that it's very difficult to send troops from France to Danzig. So it did once in 1733. Um, and it's the same problem now with NATO maneuvers in the Baltic states, I think. So you can do it by air. Um, but this relationship goes on with the, I talked about the Crimean alliance, and its apogee in a way is the opening of the Suez Canal, the Empress Eugenie swans into Istanbul, Alexandra, Cairo, huge fanfare received by the Sultan, goes to a dinner party given by the Sultan, men and women equally together in Domobarchi Palace, a foundation of the Galatasaray, Lycée, and so on, and French cultural influence is always increasing, so French becomes the second language of many people in Istanbul and of course in Egypt perhaps even more. So it's 1914 is the break. 1870 for military power because of the French defeat in the Franco-Prussian War. 1914 for the diplomatic and cultural relationship. Okay. And there's a break at the time. And of course the Ottoman Empire didn't have to join Germany and Austria. I wanted to say something. Um, <clears throat> yes, um, I never really understood till I saw those drawings you showed uh, of Zimirna and, and Athens and, and Constantinople and all that, what it meant in magnificent, magnificent 16th century. It really showed amazing uh, little miniatures, but really enlightened me in the sense that how it was and what it was, what it meant to be the magnificent. Oh, yeah. Well, oh, well. Yeah, it was amazing. Thanks. Thank you. And there's this saying, if you want wisdom, go to Europe. If you want wealth, go to India. But if you want imperial magnificence, come to Constantinople. Mm -hmm. We have any more questions, please? 
What are you writing next? I'm planning a book on 19th century Europe, including the Ottoman Empire and Egypt, and showing how it was united by a common search for constitutional monarchy between 1814 and 1918. And that's why Bulgaria and Greece and Romania went shopping for monarchs. Who, which prince are they going to pick? Um, and why constitutions were so popular in Istanbul and Cairo. And um, 1908 is a constitutional revolution that trying to make the Ottoman Empire a constitutional monarchy with a two-chamber parliament and a written constitution. All these written constitutions were basically borrowing from each other, mm. basically from the French and American constitutions. Uh, Britain had no inference because it didn't have a, a written constitution. Mm. And then it all, and if, if they have a working constitution, then the monarchy and the system can do quite well. But because the German Empire was had an imbalanced constitution with total royal control of the armed forces, that helped lead to 1914 and catastrophe. Mm, thank you. And again, every power was interlocked, allied to another, looking at another, looking what's happening in Vienna or Istanbul or, or London or Paris. Mm. Any more questions, please? Um. Well, if there are no more questions, um, perhaps we should just thank our, thank our speaker. But you're most welcome, uh, whilst we have the opportunity to ask such a, a world expert, such an erudite scholar, um, his thoughts. It seems a pity to miss them. But... Um, I think we may just have to to to, to ask to, uh, um, and say thank you very much um, for, for for a talk which will long remain in our memory in these sad times, and we look forward to welcoming you uh, whenever you like to 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 uh, a face to face event that we will try to make hybrid, and so that you can broadcast globally at the same time as entertaining us uh, in a specific setting. I look forward to that. Happy Christmas and happy New Year. Happy Merry Christmas. Christmas for thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Craig, for organising it. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Craig. Okay. Have a nice evening, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you. you very much. Bye. 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 Um, who, who's left?